Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, my friends, uh, thank you for you, to, to all of you who are uh, you know, battling the dreaded post-lunch uh, slot. Uh, let's try to stay together. Um, I sometimes feel I want to fall asleep as well, but, <laughs> but let's stay together. Okay, so uh, what, um, what were we talking about? Remember, we, we were in this world in which there are Byzantine nodes, there are rational nodes. Uh, we saw that it seems that just hoping that our normal Byzantine tolerant protocols are also going to handle the rational case and just they happen to be Nash equilibria, uh, that doesn't quite work. So we have to define, um, we, we are to the point in which if we want to um, um, come up with a way in which we can prove properties about system built in an environment in which a priori every node may deviate from the specification, uh, we need to come up with a model. We suggested this bar model that I was talking about. And we need to come up with uh, some notion of, uh, of uh, equilibrium that is going to be robust in an environment in which there are also Byzantine nodes. Okay? That's where we are. Good. So let me suggest one such notion. Okay? Uh, the notion that I'm going to suggest is actually inspired by the a resounding success that Marcus has been telling us about and, and uh, Miguel before it with respect to the guarantees that uh, we are able to provide in another environment that seems very hard to deal with, the Byzantine environment. In the Byzantine environment, we know that uh, when we build Byzantine fault tolerant systems, these systems are able to you know, guarantee the safety and liveness property despite up to T failure, and you don't know who's failing. You don't know how they're failing, and yet you are able to provide these guarantees, right? Really nice. So an attractive way of uh, uh, providing a notion of equilibrium is one that you know, is inspired by, by such generality and say, you know, something that would be really nice in, is to come up with a notion of equilibrium in which we are able to incentivize, uh, to use that, you know, possibly a neologism, but <laughs> to incentivize um, uh, nodes, to rational nodes to actually participate and be, you know, stay on the equilibrium, despite up to T failures, just like before, again, independent of who the faulty nodes are and how they behave. Right? This seems like a very, I, I certainly seems very attractive to me. Um, and it turns out that uh, there has been, uh, a few years ago, there, was a there has been a proposal to actually try to capture this very desirable intuition. This is work by um, uh, Abraham, uh, Halpern, and Dolev, who have proposed uh, as a solution concept, a solution um, um, notion that provides these properties. The first one is that the uh, system, this uh, KT robust equilibrium, has the property that is T regret free, namely uh, independent of who the T Byzantine nodes are, at most T, but independent of who the T Byzantine nodes are, we know that we are going to have an equilibrium that independent of who they are, independent of what they do, we know that rational nodes will want to stay on equilibrium. Okay? Even if they don't know who the faulty nodes are, what they're going to do. Um, furthermore, uh, this notion uh, requires um, the equilibrium to be what they call K-resilient. Namely, suppose that nodes collude. Hmm? As we will see, we only, we, if, if we have time, we're going to get back to collusion towards the end of our four-hour conversation. Uh, but in, for the system that I'm going to present to you, I'm actually assuming that rational nodes do not collude. If I make nodes that are colluding, I'm going to treat as Byzantine for the system that I described. Recently, we have come up with a way in which we can hopefully do better than that. But instead, they go immediately for something really, really nice. This notion that what you would like to make sure is that even if up to k nodes get together, the equilibrium protocol continues to be, the equilibrium strategy continues to be an equilibrium strategy. Okay? And furthermore, 
this is um, another property that is sort of uh, orthogonal to these, they want uh, their equilibrium to be T immune, namely independent of what T node may do. This, remember, are the Byzantine nodes that can do whatever. They could be whoever and do whatever. Independent of that, you have the guarantees that they cannot hurt the utility of the good guys. Okay? The utility of the good guys is not diminished by the fact that up to T nodes. This is a very nice notion of equilibrium. Um, uh, and um, we are going to uh, begin uh, uh, looking at it first from the perspective of these regret-free guarantees. Okay, that they provide. Um, again, if something is T regret free, just to be, um, to be uh, precise, then given a set of at most T nodes that are playing some strategy tau that could be whatever, I don't know what strategy is, I don't know who are the member of T except that I know they are at most T, then if I'm a node that is not part of that set, if I look at my utility in which uh, the T node play whatever they want to play, and everybody else plays the equilibrium strategy that I'm calling sigma star. Um, I should be, uh, it sh things should be such that uh, I would be better off by playing sigma star than I would be by playing any other uh, strategy sigma prime that I may want to play instead. Okay? So X, who's not part of T, has no incentive to deviate from sigma star and embrace sigma prime, despite the fact that there are up to t nodes uh, that are playing whatever. Okay? And these nodes could be whomever. Is that clear? That's a question? Oh, I thought behind, behind you, Chandu. Okay. So that seems like very nice, right? So um, it's very nice. Uh, but if you think about it, uh, uh, suppose, that, suppose that I tell you that um, I'm going to give you a strategy that is going to have the following, you know, uh, going to have the following guarantee. Suppose that the strategy applies somehow to, um, to getting a car insurance. Somehow the strategy that you're going to choose in terms of whether you're going to pay your premium for your car insurance, should be one in which you are not going to have regrets about the choice that you have made, whether or not you're going to have an accident, because you don't know how the world, the strategy that the world is going to play against you. So if you have an accident, that should be a best response, whatever you call an equilibrium. If you don't have an accident, that should still be an accident, a best response. If you find out, you know, you walk on the street and there is some crazy millionaires that likes ragged individuals that go around the streets of Bangalore without a car insurance, and he will give a million rupees to each such individual, that still, whatever you choose, that should be the best response in all of these three scenarios. It doesn't seem uh, super likely that you're going to find a lot of situations in which you'll find an equilibrium that has this property, right? And in fact, one... Uh, out of, uh, out of um, you know, intuition, one uh, situation in which uh, it turns out to be difficult to, in fact, it turns out to be impossible to build one such uh, regret-free equilibrium is for what I call, what I'm going to call um, uh, fault-tolerant communication games. And a fault-tolerant communication game is a sort of a game version of uh, what I'm or that, so it's a game that is trying to model um, generic fault-tolerant distributed protocols. And let me ask you what, uh, let me tell you what I'm asking about fault-tolerant communication game. I'm asking that um, it should be the case, since it is a fault-tolerant game, hmm, it should be the case that, uh, at, you know, I should be able to find a strategy in which... Um, the nodes, the, nodes in, uh, uh, the nodes in the system are able to achieve the functionality that the system is trying to provide, even if one node, say, is actually not sending or receiving anything. Better be the case because if it is a fault tolerant system, I could have a node that crashes right away, is not sending or, or receiving anything. If, if the system claims to be fault tolerant, it should be able to handle that. 
Um, then the second thing that I'm going to ask of my, uh, what I call a full time communication game is that sending messages costs you something. If sending messages costs you nothing, life, you know, if it turns out that sending an exponential number of messages costs you exactly like sending one message, then you live in a very interesting world. But, uh, and uh, furthermore, I'm going to assume that some message needs to be sent. There is at least somebody that needs to communicate with somebody else. Okay, in order for this functionality to be to occur, and I would argue that a lot of interesting systems are uh, capture, you know, are within the scope of this photon communication game. I'm not really asking very much of the photon communication game. There is some communication, some node may crash intuitively, and communication costs. And um, uh, unfortunately, one can show that it's it's impossible to build a regret-free equilibrium for fault-tolerant communication games. And the intuition for why it's impossible to build uh, such equilibrium is that, um, remember, the equilibrium should hold no matter who is faulty and no matter what it does. Right? So uh, in particular, it should be the case that um, if there is just one node that is faulty and that node, um, and that node decides to actually play the crash strategy. Well, if I have, if, uh, and that happens to be, you know, and I have to communicate with that node, okay, the protocol calls me to communicate with that node. Of course, I'm going to be better off by not communicating with that node that is going to be crashed right from the beginning than I would be by communicating with that node. And I know that even if that node crashes, the functionality by FT1, the functionality should hold anyway. Right? So I'm not going to get any extra benefit. Uh, I'm not going to lose benefit because I'm not communicating with that node. But I'm going to certainly save on cost by not communicating with that node. So clearly, deviating by not, you know, a strategy that calls me for not sending a message to that node would be preferable to a strategy that instead calls me for sending a message to that node. So, um, so it turns out that deviating in a form that uh, in which I don't send a message to that node would be advantageous. And instead, remember, in a regret-free situation, I should not regret the fact that I sent a message to that node, even if after the fact, I find that that node crashed right away. And that doesn't quite work, okay? Um, yes? That, that's an interesting question. That's an interesting question. So, um, so I would agree with you that seems like a very strong requirement to regret freedom. So one thing that is natural to ask is, is it possible to weaken it huh? in some interesting way? And so the way in which we thought weakening it, you know, when we saw this notion, we, we first convinced ourselves that it was elegant mathematically, but if I try to build a system, it's going to be very hard to build a system where I can provide these guarantees, and I'm interested Remember, my, what I like to do is um, uh, try to come up with, with ways which, through theory, allow me to build better systems. Ultimately, I'm interested in, in, in building systems. And from my perspective, this was a very interesting notion, but I find it difficult to build system on top of it. So I asked myself, is it possible to weaken it? And you know, there is, uh, we know that if we don't know neither who fails, nor how they fail, huh? we know that there is no equilibrium. Okay? Where a trivial equilibrium here, I say no non-trivial in that there must be some communication. A trivial equilibrium, if I can't find an equilibrium in which nobody talks with anybody else, then, okay? So two natural ways in which you could imagine uh, weakening regret-free is suppose that, um, suppose that I uh, know who the faulty nodes are. I just don't know how they're going to behave, but I know who they are. I know it beforehand, who's faulty and who's not. I just don't know which strategy. And it turns out 
And uh, uh, in the interest of time, I thought I was going to be further at uh, this point. In the interest of time, uh, just trust me that in general, there is no non-trivial equilibrium. When I say in general, uh, what I mean is that um, if uh, uh, the faulty nodes, remember, they can play whatever they want. If they play something, the only situation in which there is an equilibrium is one in which the, these nodes happen to choose the crash strategy, and all the good nodes don't speak to them. Basically, there is only an equilibrium in the fairly contrived case in which, despite these guys are part of the system, we a priori decide that we are not going to talk to them. So in practice, there is <laughs> no uh, equilibrium. Um, and the other way in which I could imagine weakening this is by assuming that I know the strategy. The strategy is known. I just don't know who the faulty nodes are, but I know the strategy. Okay? And it turns out that one can prove that there is also no non-trivial equilibrium there. So it seems to be, I mean, at least the lesson that uh, we drew from uh, these findings was that um, it was hard to imagine using regret freedom as the foundation for a notion or a solution concept that uh, was going to be useful in building systems. So uh, uh, so instead of going, you know, so we, what we decided to do is to, if you want, to use a, a really lame joke, to move from uh, uh, the land of the free to the home of the brave. And instead of going for regret-free equilibrium, we um, suggest that a more, oh, sorry, we suggest that a more interesting uh, notion is one of our regret-brave equilibrium. In a regret-brave equilibrium, what you do is you build for yourself a model of the world as you participate in the game. And you have some expectations of how the world is going to behave. And you try to come up with a best response to your expectations. Um, of course, if your expectation is wrong, the end result at the end of the game, may not be a best response. Your strategy may prove not to be a best response if your model of the world is very inaccurate. Uh, something that has saddened me very much while I was here is that uh, there have been a number of earthquakes in, in Italy, uh, exactly in my region, in fact, just outside of my city. And whoever the engineers that had built whatever buildings they had built there, they had proceeded under the assumption that is frankly the assumption that I lived under, that our region was not uh, earthquake active. And under those assumptions, those buildings were standing. If, if the world happens, to, you know, if, you're, if the world doesn't happen to match your expectation, in engineering, it's not surprising that then the end result may not be regret-free, right? But, uh, so I would argue that this approach that we call regret bravery is what we do every day when we try to uh, deal with uncertainty. We create a model of the world, and we try to provide the best response to that model. One thing that I want to make clear is that in doing so, uh, we, are not, we are not somehow restricting how Byzantine nodes behave. Right? Byzantine nodes will do whatever they want to do. The we, would, we have a model of them. doesn't mean that they are bound to do what our model says they are going to do. Again, uh, we are going to build, try to maximize our response um, given a certain model. And if um, the uh, real world violates our expectation, then our incentives may not be there. You know, at the end, we may find that um, we are not regret free. And certainly, is, uh, we are not trying to weaken somehow the guarantees of, of Byzantine fault tolerance. The, the, a solution concept is really not about making sure that your system is Byzantine fault tolerant or not. Being Byzantine fault tolerant is something that has little to do with um, creating the incentive mechanism to allow rational nodes to be part of the system. If I were to build a bar system, I would make it Byzantine fault tolerant independent of that. The question is, given that I have a Byzantine fault tolerant system, how can I um, incentivize rational players to actually play ball? Okay, so um, 
One, so what are ways in which, what are notions that I could use if I'm trying to play this game in which uh, I'm living in a regret brave world? Well, a, a fairly natural thing to think about is, for instance, to go for a um, notion in which rational nodes uh, are fairly risk averse. They're really conservative when they are thinking about the worlds around them. For instance, what they may think is that Byzantine nodes are out there to get them. Hmm? And what they're going to try to do is actually consider all the possible strategies that Byzantine nodes may play and figure out what is their response to the worst case that Byzantine nodes can do for any strategy that these rational nodes can play. Okay? And then try to find the strategy that would maximize their utility given that Byzantine nodes are going to try to do the worst thing they can possibly do to them. Okay? So they're trying to maximize their worst case, so to speak. Okay? Uh, that's one possibility. Uh, and here is, uh, you know, here is a notion you could imagine that you have, you know, this notion of resilience is still there. The resilience is this uh, um, notion of being able to tolerate collusion. So you could still use that, you know, you don't have to give up also the ability to tolerate collusion. You only give up this notion of being regret-free. Um, um, and if you use a maximum in equilibrium, you would have a notion of equilibrium that would look something like this. Of course, instead you could use, instead of maximum, you could use other uh, types of equilibrium. For instance, you could use equilibrium based on your belief that different nodes may be of a particular type. There are three types of nodes, for instance, nodes that are Byzantine, nodes that are altruistic, nodes that, nodes that are acquiescent, and nodes that are rational. And maybe as you play, so you start with certain expectations about what the distribution might be, and as you play, that distribution may change on the basis of what you learn, and your strategy may respond to that. There was a question. They consider all the possible strategies. And I mean, that's what the Maximin uh, notion is. Uh, they basically say, OK, intuitively they say, OK, what is the worst case, the worst thing that Byzantine nodes, assuming that in fact in the system, if I assume at most t, they would say, let's assume that there are in fact t Byzantine nodes. Let's see that they are trying to do the worst case to me. And I start from a certain strategy. Uh, they are trying to do the worst case to me. When I consider whether I want to deviate, I'm going to ask myself, OK, let's consider this alternative strategy. And let's assume that once I move to the alternative strategy, the, bad guy, the, the Byzantine nodes are trying to hurt me as bad as they can. If it turns out that under those circumstances I'm better off deviating, then I will deviate. Otherwise, if it turns out that by deviating, the Byzantine nodes can hurt me more than they could potentially possibly hurt me when I was that, then I would stay in so I, I would be risk averse. Yes. Is that here you are regret free only if you uh, you are regret free only under the assumption that Byzantine nodes are in fact as vicious as you imagine them to be. Byzantine nodes, may, may, there may not be T Byzantine nodes in the system, for instance. If there are fewer, maybe you could find a more, uh, you know, if at the end of the game you find out, oh my goodness, there was no Byzantine node in the system. And look, I played this suboptimal strategy because I thought in case there are Byzantine nodes, at the end you find that there are none and you say, oh my goodness, if I only knew that Microsoft was going to double in value over the next year, I, you know, I would have invested in a different way. Can your assumption under approximate? Uh, I'm assuming that you can um, assess what is the worst thing that they can do to you. OK, so in that sense, no. OK, so after all of this, I thought that I would, I would try to show you some systems that actually um, have been built under, in fact, a notion of regret, regret bravery that is based on um, a maximum notion. Okay? And I'm going to show you two systems. Um, I'm going to first just sketch 
one system, well, by the way, another good thing about bar is that there are so many jokes that you can do with, so for instance, we, you can have a backup system and call it Barbie. Uh, or as we will see, you can have a mechanism in which uh, nodes distribute, in our case, they were distributing content, in particular video uh, updates, and you could, based on the gossip mechanism that um, Robert was talking about, and of course, bar gossip, right? In a bar, what do you do? Uh, so anyway, um, let me start by uh, describing, so we are going to describe first Barbie, and then I'm going to talk about a couple of papers that actually have taken this notion of um, uh, content distribution in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, uh, and actually have, uh, we are going to first look at a system that is going to be theoretically, I think, fairly satisfying. And yet we are going to see that for all its nice uh, theoretical guarantees, is going to be uh, something like um, certain philosophical constructions that people did in the West in the Middle Ages. They are nice and self-consistent, but when you try to embed them in the real world of today, you just say, what? Although when you look at them inside, they're all logically, they all logically make sense. But when you embed them in the real world, and you will see that the original system tries to get embedded in the real world, but there are some failings that we try to address further without giving up rigorous uh, handling, okay, dealing. Now, of course, you can try to address the practicalities by just giving up on all your, uh, the ability to prove stuff, okay? All right, so the first thing that I want to do is to talk about this bar, uh, this Barbie as a first example of uh, a bar system. And one possible way to justify this work is, you know, imagine that you are in a graduate student dorm at UT Austin. Um, this is an actual picture of a graduate student dorm at UT Austin. Again, another shameless plug. Uh, and um, and uh, one thing that you may want to do is because the university has spent so much money on the swimming pool, uh, they haven't really thought about putting up a backup system for the laptops that the students have, right? And so what you could imagine is to build a peer-to-peer -peer system in which um, you are going, I mean, Chandu, for instance, may kindly take some of the stuff that is on my laptop, and I'm going to back it up on his laptop, and perhaps in return, he's going to do, I'm going to do the same thing for him. Huh? So you could imagine that in a cooperative fashion, there would be exchanges like, hey, you know, uh, right? And they would exchange, right? And uh, life would be good. Uh, so, yeah, it, <laughs> you know, it may not quite be, you know, always be as ideal as you may think though, right? Uh, once you have stuff on your, on your, uh, um, you know, I, I can already see Chandu saying, why the heck I'm keeping this stuff for Lorenzo? When there, there are all these uh, wonderful recipes about uh, Italian food that I'm much more interested in and uh, decide to throw away my stuff. And you know, what, are, what are we going to do about that? So um, the question is, can we build a system in which, uh, in fact, uh, uh, this dude here wouldn't have uh, an incentive to deviate. They, he would have an incentive to actually you know, stay with the program. Hmm? So I'm not going to go into uh, the details of this, while instead I'm going to do into the details of the next system. Here there is uh, some high level things that I just want you to appreciate. First, I'm going to tell you something about the setup that we were thinking about. Um, we're thinking about something in the hundreds of clients. Uh, we assume that clients are strong, that the entities had strong identities. Okay, so we were not concerned about, for those of you who are familiar with it, we were not concerned with things like uh, Sybil attacks in which somebody can create a bunch of fake identities. And um, we're assuming that the number of faulty nodes in a Byzantine sense was less than a third, okay? We were not assuming anything, forgive me, here I'm just still talking about altruistic. We were not assuming anything with respect of the presence in the mix of acquiescent nodes. We assumed that the Byzantines were no more than uh, one third, in fact less. Uh, 
but um, rational nodes could be any number. Uh, we assume that rational nodes were not colluding, so that's certainly a weakness. We were dealing with colluding nodes, we were modeling them as Byzantine. Um, the system was eventually synchronous in order to be able to avoid all the impossibility results that uh, uh, Marcos was telling us about, and for simplicity, reliable FIFO channels. And then we were um, assuming that there was some crypto that was not going to be broken. Uh, and in terms of uh, the incentive structure, uh, we thought that there were, you know, the benefit was in the service that was being provided. The cost was expressed in terms of bandwidth, storage requirement. Certainly there was a big cost if you were caught cheating. Um, and we were assuming an infinite horizon game. An infinite horizon game, we may have to revisit this in terms of an assumption towards the end of uh, our fourth lecture probably. Uh, uh, in an infinite horizon game, you assume that although the game itself may be finite, the players play as if they never knew that we are about to get to the end of the game. So you can avoid sort of these boundary conditions. Because if I know that I'm at the end of the game, I may behave differently. Because you know, if uh, you know, I, I'm willing to, you know, there is a saying in, uh, in uh, the US, says what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Right? So if I know that I'm about to leave Vegas and I'm never going to be seen in Vegas again, I may actually behave in a way that wouldn't make my parents proud uh, and, you know, uh, without fearing uh, retribution. So, okay, so at a high level, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. At a high level, this is what I would like to happen. That should be, uh, you know, A talks to B, says store my file, uh, okay. And after the OK, you know, some time passes. I don't know what is, uh, uh, you know, some time passes. And then you said, uh, A says, can I have my file? And B says, sure, here it is. That's how we would like it to work. Of course, what may happen instead is um, store my file and ta 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 I don't know elevator music in, uh, in India, but uh, so you wait and wait and wait, nothing happens. Huh? And A, no, B doesn't want to do the work. And A says, hey, I sent work to B and never received an answer. And B, rightly or wrongly, maybe that's, maybe, uh, in fact, A never sent anything, for all we know. Uh, B can say, well, I, I never received a request from work from A. If I had received a request, of course I'd be happy to, to do it, but I never received such a request. So, we find ourselves in a situation that sometimes is referred to as he said, she said. Now, who knows who's telling the truth? Well, there would be a way to know who's telling the truth. The way to know who's telling the truth is if there were someone around that could be trusted, to which, you know, maybe you could route communication through it somehow, and that it would actually take care of resolving this kind of, uh, of issue. But the question, of course, in a system that claims to be bar, the question is, why would anybody want to do that? Right? Why would they want to take the extra load of having to take care of the stupid discussions between A and B? So if I could assume that the system includes acquiescent nodes, then I, I just design my system so that an acquiescent node will do that. But what if I don't have acquiescent node? I said I, want to, I didn't want to assume acquiescent node. And this is one of the, what I think is a really neat idea of, uh, of that paper that I'm just going to give you the high order bit of. But take a step back. Something that we have seen, you have seen in these two weeks is how we are able to build systems that give the abstraction, provide the abstraction of never failing out of components you know, this system are made out of components, each of which can in fact fail with some probability, right? And we have seen using techniques like state machine replication that was discussed last week, how by coordinating a bunch of replicas, each of which may fail, can provide to the outside world the um, illusion of interacting with a single node who never fails. So what we were actually um, able to do was to 
Um, yeah, that was the solution, and uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, so what, what the, forgive me, I got uh, sidetracked. The point that I was making here is, as you're building this system, it's actually really nice to have some abstraction that you can rely upon. So one abstraction that would be nice to have is the abstraction of an altruistic node. And one in simple way to implement that abstraction is to have an altruistic node. But if you don't have it around, can you build it? And, uh, and the way in which we build it is by coming up with a state machine replication protocol that is going to be a Byzantine fault tolerant Nash equilibrium. Okay? So it's a Nash equilibrium, the one that we give to these nodes, so that rational nodes will not want to deviate, in the presence of Byzantine nodes. And through this protocol that these guys are running, just like before I was able to create the abstraction of a correct node out of nodes that were potentially faulty, here I'm able to create the abstraction of a altruistic node through the state machine replication out of node, each of which are either rational or Byzantine, which is kind of neat, I think, uh, if I can say so myself. Okay? So there is this um, RSM that actually does that. And then this another uh, thing that we, so we, we, we have this altruistic auditor that we are able to build out of uh, these faulty components. And, um, and another uh, abstraction that we found to be useful was to have, you know, another you know, set of services that we found to be useful is to have some way for, for uh, nodes to be able to reliably, perhaps, you know, using the abstraction underneath, reliably assign work to other nodes with the expectation that that work would be done or else consequences would, would follow. So uh, one way in which this could be achieved is by having one node talk to the auditor, which means really talk to the state machine, and say, hey, can you please you know, uh, back up this file for me? The state machine takes care to pass it to B so that B cannot claim I never seen this. And then there will be a receipt that comes back. So in principle, I can, yes. How does this compare with the other thing I was looking for earlier, that you said you have uh, several types of listener systems which are recording all the actions that you do to every node that you have? Is it similar in some way? There is, there is some similarity. Uh, in his, in, uh, in Peter's, well, I, I, I'm familiar with Peter's work, but I wasn't here, so I don't know exactly what he said. But in that view, uh, all the um, all the incentive uh, to behave appropriately is based on the fact that if you don't, you're going to be bumped very hard on the head. So there is a there is a logging uh, mechanism that is in place to ensure that I'm not trying to design the system to make you want to do the right thing, but out of fear of consequences, you will do the right thing in that view of the world. This is if you want a more general view of the world that allows you to want to do the right thing not only out of fear, but also because it is, in, you know, it is to your advantage. They define to your advantage, they make basically the cost of deviating infinitely large so that if you deviate, you really, I mean, you really don't want to deviate and they have a mechanism to make sure that if you do, you're going to be caught. Okay? Um, so, so this Lo logically, it, it works. But uh, the problem is that whenever I'm trying to communicate something, I always have to go through this state machine. And you know, if I'm trying to pass these files, this may be large. There is a lot of, lo of load. Right? Of course, remember, I have to go through the state machine to give me this abstraction of this trustworthy auditor. I can A cannot talk to B directly. Otherwise, I get back to the he said, she said. So how do I get out of uh, that? And um, the notion that we ended up using is, is the notion of uh, credible threats. So let me give you an example of a credible threat. Uh, suppose that I have two drivers that are approaching maybe a roundabout, okay? And um, neither wants to give the right of way. Right? And, um, and basically they're trying to figure out who's going to blink, who's going to, you know, uh, eventually stop. And the question is, you know, everybody, they're both thinking, well, I have to, you know, I'm going to keep on going because 
the other guy is going to back off. At some point, it's going to understand that I'm really serious and it's going to back off. So one thing that you could do if you were to be really serious and make your threat that you're going to be doing credible is actually to take the steering wheel and rip it off the dashboard, looking at the other guy in the eyes, and then throwing it outside of your window. Huh? That is what in the United States is called, uh, you know, that a situation like this is called a game of chicken. Of course, here in Bangalore, it's called driving. But uh, <laughs> there is called a game of chicken. And, um, and what, we, uh, what we do uh, is actually exploit this notion of credible threat, although not quite as dramatically as I just described them for you. So here is how we, but it's sort of an interesting, uh, I thought, sort of, sort of an interesting nugget. Um, here is how we proceed. If A wants to ask B to do work, what it does is actually sends to, uh, the, um, to W something that is a vow, it's a promise, very small. Okay? And the promise is the following, that unless, um, unless W is going to receive from A, either eventually from A, either a receipt that says that B, you know, it's going to say, I want to, sorry, forgive me. The vow is going to tell to W, I'm going to ask something of B. And you should ignore me. You should cut me out of the system, A says, unless I either uh, come to you with um, a receipt from B, or I come to you using the heavy way to actually get my request through. Okay? I could always resort to the heavy way, namely just going through the full state machine replication that I was discussing before. Okay? So basically, one way to look at this is that A is going to stick his neck out and say, if I don't come to you with a receipt, you can kick me out. Now, after saying this, A has a very strong incentive to come up with a receipt. Because otherwise, A is off, right? After doing that, um, actually, what is going to happen is that W is going to inform B that A just made such a vow. So B knows that A is very serious now. So in particular, it knows that if, so OK, so what is going to happen? Then what is going to happen is that uh, uh, A is actually, after this vow business, A is actually going to send the file directly to B. And I'm going to claim that B will actually honor that request. The reason that it will honor that request is that it knows that if it doesn't honor the request in a timely fashion, what A is going to do is actually submit the request again through the state machine. And going through the state machine for B, at that point, B would have to respond. And it would be more expensive for B. We designed the protocol, so that and it's easy to design it that way, so that it would be more expensive for B to go through the state machine than it is to address A's request immediately. And it knows that A is going to be a sticker, is, a stickler is going to go through W unless B responds. And therefore, B is going to respond right away, OK? Because the threat that A made is credible. A threatened to go through W, and it will do so. Because if it doesn't, A itself is going to suffer. OK? So uh, well, we have 15 minutes, right? Something like that. Yes? We are, that's part of the magic of state machine replication. We are, remember, the only thing that we are assuming is that the number of Byzantine nodes, since we are assuming no bound on the number of rational nodes, we are assuming that the number of Byzantine nodes is less than t. Le sorry, is less than or equal to t, and the total number of nodes must be at least uh, 3t plus 1. So just like the abstraction of a correct node may fail if the number of faulty nodes exceeds the threshold for which we guarantee safety, so the abstraction of an altruistic node would miserably fail if the number of Byzantine nodes exceeds. Yes? Uh, there are, 
in, in the protocol that is involved with running the state machine replication, there is significantly more communication that goes through. You have seen some of these. I mean, they have to run consensus. No, but it's easy because it's designed for the data communication. It is because the state machine involves all the protocol, all the processes. Okay, so that's actually how B becomes aware of what is gone through W because it sees it as part of participating in state machine replication. That's also why we couldn't really make this very large. Okay, so I. I uh, could tell you a little more about, you know, how actually the, the system works. Uh, but given that we don't have a lot of time, and instead I would like to make sure that we have a chance to talk about some of the things that I would like to talk tomorrow, uh, if uh, these slides are going to be available for you, what I would like to do is to get us started on a very different system uh, that we designed that also uh, we wanted to be BART on. See, when we did this, we thought that it was really cool to uh, having been able to design a bar tolerant state machine replication. But on the one hand, it seems that there were some problems in scalability, one. Uh, two, state machine replication are good, but there are a lot of systems that are not based on state machine replication. And this was, you know, a fairly out in left field way of looking at things. If you wanted to convince people that actually, or try to hope to convince people that this was actually something they should pay some attention to, you can't simply do one system state machine replication then call it a day and say victory. We wanted to show that the, 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 the model had legs to actually do something different. And so we asked ourselves, what is another paradigm of, uh, uh, that is used to build systems that is very different from state machine replication? And allow me to uh, skip a few slides here. Um, and uh, what we ended up doing was um, uh, looking at uh, something that was based on these gossip techniques that uh, Robert talked about. But before we get there, there is one thing that is very important to me uh, and I want to share with you. Um, it's sort of uh, a little bit of a you know um, war story. When we started, when the reason that we started working on this was we were t everybody was talking about peer-to-peer -peer system. I didn't want to work in peer-to-peer -peer system because everybody was working in peer-to-peer -peer system. So I didn't, by definition, uh, you know, it, it was a very crowded area. But there were some students that wanted to have a reading group, so they had their reading group. And once I went to join this group, and we started talking, and it became clear that. There ought to be some game theoretic component to all of this. The only problem is that none of us knew a thing about game theory. Okay, so we knew a thing or two about um, Byzantine fault tolerance, but we really didn't know anything about game theory. So there are, uh, to me, something that was very that the decision that was crucial at that time that I um, very happy that uh, I made is that we didn't. We that we were not going to try to acquire encyclopedic knowledge in game theory before trying to actually build something. What instead we decided to do was that we were going to aim for an application that should make us honest. And in some respect, while we were having a background thread in which we were trying to learn things, but we were going to, at least at the beginning, use a, a learn on demand kind of situation. We were going to be driven by the actual problems that we were facing. We, we faced a problem, how do, is the literature, does the literature already know how to deal with this or can they provide us with some ideas? Many times when you're starting on, particularly when you are a graduate student, sometimes you feel that you need to know everything in order to be able to uh, make a contribution. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a pitfall that you should be, I, I think you should be careful about that. But that doesn't mean that you should, of course, be scholarly. Huh? So it's not that I just said, oh, okay, well, relax, who cares? We are just going. Of course, you, you run really scared, right, at the beginning. You feel that you're walking on thin ice. Uh, but I don't think that just staying put, waiting for you know, winter to come, when the ice is going to be sufficiently large for you to walk comfortably, is, is, is a desirable option. Okay? But anyway. Uh, a completely, uh, you know, a very different application and a very different uh, infrastructure. Here we were going for uh, 
you know, something like peer-to-peer uh, -peer live streaming. Um, and there are, you know, a uh, bunch of uh, actual real-life examples of systems that use peer-to-peer -peer for live streaming of events. Um, and if you think about it, there are a bunch of challenges if you try to build peer-to-peer -peer system that has, um, you know, that tries to address that particular application. Jitter is, of course, one. Um, uh, you have to, I mean, maybe everything is easy to do if you are uh, donated an unbounded amount of bandwidth, but if you wanted to have a peer-to-peer -peer system, for instance, where peers that are at home, you know, with your, their, their normal, in the United States, uh, at least if you try to be at home and you have, a, um, you know, home connection, uh, even if it is high speed, there is not a lot of bandwidth that you have available to you. We'll see that uh, later. You have to be able to handle the possibility that there may be nodes that are coming into this system and nodes that are leaving the system constantly, potentially, right? Um, and the system may include Byzantine nodes, may include rational nodes, um, and you can't be too lazy in making sure that deadline, that, that updates for a stream, if it is a live event, are delivered, because you, know, you don't want to have to wait you don't want to hear the entire uh, uh, Bangalore erupt because India has beaten Pakistan in the final, and, and uh, you instead are still there waiting to figure out what is going to happen, because it, it's sort of a spoiler, right? Uh, so there is a timeliness requirement. So in this system, of course, the way in which it would work would be analogous to what I was discussing before. There would be a broadcaster. In this case, we assume that the broadcaster is trusted, if the broadcaster is not trusted. The broadcaster is trusted, and maybe the broadcaster is going to create these uh, chunks and is going to sign them to make sure that integrity of the chunks is not going to be uh, um, an issue, even in the presence of, of Byzantine nodes. And then it's going to, com to send them to some nodes through channels that may not necessarily be reliable. So some of these may be lost. And the idea is that you know, through the magic of gossip, they would exchange messages with each other and everybody knows everything. Of course, though, the problem is that if you are in a rational setting, uh, this part works well, but uh, it's, uh, it's unclear why the green nodes would want to communicate with the um, red node. And in fact, if you uh, take what uh, perhaps interestingly may be called a, a, a sad gossip protocol, uh, in the sense of a single administrative domain gossip protocol, uh, and you put it in a, in a mad environment, uh, the results are, are sad indeed. Um, this is, uh, so here I'm showing what happens to the probability of receiving a particular update by a node as the proportion of rational nodes in the system increases. Well, as you can see, it starts really well, and then it goes down. Um, but you could say, well, that's not that bad after all. I mean, look at the percentage of, uh, you know, you need quite a bit of uh, rational nodes in the system in order to be able to start suffering. Maybe, maybe I'm lucky and there are not going to be so many uh, rational nodes and I'm going to be able to get away with, uh, with it. The point is that this graph doesn't show you the entire story. Uh, because uh, if I look instead at the, here I should say acquiescent, if I look instead at the uh, bandwidth that is being used by uh, acquiescent nodes in order to try to make the system continue to work, what you're seeing is that as the number of uh, rational nodes increases, there is a greater and greater toll that is imposed on the acquiescent nodes. Huh? To the point that, uh, at some point, we get to a point that they just can't take it anymore and everything collapses. Okay? And this is dangerous, of course, it's dangerous in terms of performance. It's also dangerous because acquiescence shouldn't be intended as the equivalent of stupid, right? So you shouldn't design your system in a way in which you ask of acquiescent node something com truly completely irrational because that's just an incentive for them to stop being acquiescent. Um, so uh, the answer that we try to provide to this situation was to uh, come up with a, a protocol that we call uh, bar gossip. And this was, you know, the first bar tolerant gossip protocol. And our, uh, the solution concept for which we, we, we went was, you know, a Nash equilibrium. And we were actually um, 
going to, and here are the parameters, right? The benefit is from delivering the packets of the stream. The cost is bandwidth. And the protocol that was at the basis of uh, this uh, bar gossip mechanism, at least in first approximation, is a protocol that we called balanced exchange. And it's a protocol that, um, you know, I don't know if you guys have cards of uh, cricket players. When I was a kid, there were cards of soccer players that, you know, outside of schools they would give out. And then you would spend your time just trading these cards with others. And the goal was, of course, to fill the entire album with all the collection. So here, the, the general idea of the balanced exchange is going to be similar. I have, you know, I have a bunch of uh, cards. And you have other cards. And we're going to compare the cards that we have. And we're going to exchange these cards. And we're going to do this on a round-based scheme. And we have to somehow make sure that if I gave you my card, you're not going to say, hey, very nice meeting you, and going away, right? Um, so um, in trying to build this protocol, as you will see, uh, there are going to be what I hope you will find some neat uh, insight. But uh, these neat insights were really the result of trying, on the basis also of our experience with uh, Barbie, try to, um, uh, you know, were driven, if you want, uh, by some principles that we started to extract from our experience from building Barbie before and turn out to be very good guiding lights in trying to uh, build uh, bar gossip. And these um, principles um, are the following. Um, the first principle was to restrict uh, choice. The idea is, intuitively, is that if a system has a lot of non-determinism in it, uh, non-determinism allows a strategic node, you know, a selfish node, to be able to choose among a bunch of options the one that is more convenient for it, even if the protocol doesn't call, uh, if calls for a different choice. But because of non claiming non-determinism, a selfish node may be able to make the choice that is more convenient to it, deviating, without us being able to blame it for it. Because it could always say, oh, it's, no, it's not me. It was non-determinism that made me do it. It was you know, the Twinkie defense. Uh, here is the non-determinism. Uh, you just say it's non-determinism that made me do it. And uh, so we try to eliminate as much as possible non-determinism. As you will see, this is a double-edged sword. But, and we, uh, if we find somebody red-handed, so in that sense there is a similarity with uh, some of the work that um, later uh, Peter did. Uh, if we find somebody we are going to take action. In particular, we may evict that node from the system. That's one. The second thing that we try to do is, whenever possible, try to make sure that the cost of diverging is going to be um, at least as high as the cost of being obedient. And if I make it at least as high, it doesn't have to be higher. If I make it at least as high by the argument that we were making this morning, I claim that nodes may not want to deviate. They might as well stay where they are if they have nothing to gain. Okay? And finally, there is what you know, um, we were told since we were little kids, that delaying gratification is good for you. Huh? And it turns out it's good also in this bar system. Not, don't eat all the chocolate now. Um, because uh, you know, uh, in this particular case, the reason why delaying gratification is good, intuitively, is that you know, if I put in front of a selfish node, the carrot of some benefit. I want to keep that carrot in front of that node's eyes as long as I can. Because as long, uh, if he still sees the carrot in my hand, he's going to play along. The moment I give that node the carrot, I have no leverage. Right? So we want to delay gratification to selfish node as much as we can. OK? And I think it's 3 o'clock. And uh, we are going to see tomorrow how one can build this balanced exchange protocol uh, on the basis of, this, of these um, uh, principles. And we're going to see a lot of other, not, not tomorrow, sorry, Thursday. And we're going to see a lot of other fun stuff. But for now.